It's the week of June 25th, and this is the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. This is episode 12 of 2018. Today's show will cover soybean spraying and denitrification. And now, your co-hosts, Pioneer Field Agronomists Brian Buck and Josh Offner. Well, Brian, back here another week, and uh, certainly, you know, it only been two weeks, but definitely seen a lot of change across the geography. And, and Eric, I think first we just want to start out taking a look at, you know, GDUs across the area. Certainly, we've had some warm weather. Uh, kind of how are things stacking up this year compared to last year? Absolutely. So currently in the Rochester, Minnesota area, um, for uh, uh, corn that was planted on May 2nd, we're currently at 883 GDUs um, compared to the normal, which is 664. Uh, this is up 219 GDUs from the average, which is awesome. Um, based on the next two-week forecast, we're going to be at 1,245 GDUs. Um, this is compared to last year, so in the 2017 growing season, we were only at 675 GDUs, which is only 11 above normal. So it looks like we're doing pretty well this year. Yeah, I'd say so. Getting and looking at quite a bit of corn last week, you know, we planted a lot of the corn the same time this year as we did last year, you know, within a couple of days, and we are tracking well ahead of that. I know we had some around V11 last Friday, so it's probably V12 mm-hmm. today. Uh, that corn's getting pretty tall. It's pretty good to see. I mean, anytime we get ahead, Josh, at this point in the year, it's, it always makes it easier because if you get behind going into August, it gets tough to get caught up. Yeah, and that's certainly what we dealt with last year when, you know, we came into August okay, but we had such an extremely cold August and it really set us behind the eight ball. You know, looking at that two-week forecast, Brian and Erica, you know, we, we put ourselves out to 1,245 and, and that's over forecast. It certainly sounds like we got some heat on the way, but yeah, you, know, you start looking at GDUs to pollination, well, that'll definitely put us in there. We'll see some tassels emerged uh, in some acres by that time. Yeah, and I even think, you know, in some of the coarser, or quicker grounds, maybe south of the Twin Cities, and we might see some uh, not too long after the 4th of July. So um, it'll be pretty exciting. Things are moving along, and not just corn, but beans are starting to really stretch out too, I think, here in the last week or so. For sure. Well, well Brian, we kind of roll into a couple of the topics, you know, we're going to cover today. Um, certainly soybean herbicide and soybean weed control has been front and center. We discussed it a little bit a couple of weeks ago on the show, and certainly that hasn't changed. You know, the rains and um, just the lack of dry weather has made it a challenge. We missed some pre's in some cases and still getting a lot of questions of, you know, where are we at, what worked, what didn't work, but what do we do now? Yeah, so this question's come up quite a bit here in the last week. Obviously, the deadline passed, so our options are uh, limited a little bit more now. So, uh, you know, when I look at it and I've got the question, I think first things first, where we had a, a pre-down like Sonic has worked extremely well. Um, fields have stayed really clean from that for the most part. You're starting to see some giant ragweed breaks maybe on field edges. There's a little bit of water hemp starting to break. Uh, so even though we weren't able to get a lot of acres sprayed maybe that we wanted to last week because of the rains, at least the pre's did hold really well up to this point. Uh, but it is getting to be go time here. So potentially some rain coming tomorrow. Hopefully we miss that uh, so we can get these acres covered. But uh, when it does come to going out there, um, if you do have water hemp and giant ragweed especially, I think you know using a fomosafin type product mixed with something like Everpre-X or uh, uh, Metulachlor works really well to have that two-pronged approach. Um, Fomosafin is great for burn down, a little bit of residual there, but having that Metulachlor out there really helps hold water hemp off as the season goes because it will keep emerging the whole summer. And we don't want to have to come back and uh, burn beans back here in two weeks from now if we're already making a pass right now. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I think we keep them both in, but we need to get across the acres at this point as soon as possible just because of the calendar and the stage of the beans. Oh, I agree. And certainly, you know, timing is really the big thing right now, Brian. Even as we look at number one, we'd like to get these burner products applied before the flowers get out. And certainly on early planted, early soybeans, we have some flowers out already. So certainly... We usually try to avoid those two combinations, but certainly we're going to get pushed back into that. Another thing, Brian, we do got to watch the label, and it seems a little bit early to think about it, but pre-harvest intervals, um, you we start looking at, we're getting to close to the July 1st, and some products like Matula Core, or some of the products may carry up to a 90-day pre-harvest interval, so certainly uh, be watching the labels and make sure we stay on label uh, with those products as we make those applications. And Brian, you said it best too, certainly we don't want to be thinking about a rescue um, two, three, four weeks down the row, and certainly every year we see some fields that we want to try a rescue. And the big reason we want to try to get that now and not have to worry about a rescue, and even if you think you got fairly clean fields, making sure we get them while they're small. You know, I've done rescue applications when out there in late July or even early August, where we've had to, you know, try to get water hemp that's, you know, probably over knee high, right? You know, it, you know. I always love that. Just peeking through the canopy, well, that's a <laughs> that's foot and a half tall, tall weed <laughs> at that point of the time where that's a challenge. But usually when we got to make applications that late, Brian, it's usually a 10 bushel penalty. So as we get further down the road, more flowers, more reproductive stage, 
that yield penalty of those applications gets really steep in a lot of yeah it. and weeds are always easiest to control before they're emerged and i think sometimes you know mentally it's tough to go out and put that extra herbicide out when they sh they are still pretty clean from the pre's yeah uh let's keep them that way though yeah. let's keep that pre and keep it layered um, start so, steam, start clean and stay clean. We'll yep. end the segment at that. Yep. So transitioning, Josh, uh, another point of conversation that's been coming up. Uh, we had a ton of rain, probably, you know, four or five days straight of off and on rain showers. Uh, some acres maybe were flooded. Some are just super saturated as they sat there uh, and couldn't, you know, not a lot of aero or a lot of anaerobic activity, I guess, basically taking place out there. So a uh, question that comes up, I think, the most with that is what does that mean for your nitrogen supply or, you know, do we have any denitrification taking place out there? Or did we last week? Well, I think we got a little bit of everything going on. We're likely, certainly where we've had standing water, which, you know, Eric, Brian, you've been out in the fields. We've seen water mm -hmm. standing across the area. There's Absolutely. no doubt about it. And certainly, Brian, where we where we ponded water, I, we rest assured we denitrified nitrogen but also you also got to think about where we got some lighter soils this rainfall how much are we also leaching away it's definitely a combination of both uh, but certainly something we got to be thinking about and, and Brian the one thing um, that I think is important when you think about these spots and certainly we have corn out there that's anywhere from knee high to almost head high already and certainly at what point you know where sometimes you say well it's too late nothing I can do now and really Brian I don't know if there is a point in time that it does get too late to rescue. Yeah, you know, if, if it's really tough looking corn, any time up until tassel, I think for me, as long as we're in the vegetative stage, I think there's a chance to save yield. Now, the tough question always is, depending on how many acres of the field are affected and how you can get over it, there's mm -hmm. some, you know, logistics that have to happen to be able to make it happen. But, you know, we did some work locally last year looking at um, probably the, the end of that spectrum. So applying some of that nitrogen right at like tassel and rescuing it, and that's, zero nitrogen down, coming back, letting it be look pretty rough all year, putting some down and seeing, you know, one, could we get the plant to uptake it, and two, could we save a little yield? So, Josh, I think we had three sites. you want to talk a little bit about what we saw doing that? Yeah, so, so certainly this was a staged um, effect, really, to look at a visual. But what we were curious, Brian, as we talk about the importance of nitrogen and sulfur uptake, you know, during the reproductive stage. So we, we're looking at post-tassel. So what we did is we went out and planted the corn, kind of like we normally would there uh, in early May. And all we applied was five gallons of 1030 for all uh, to one of our entries in that trial. And obviously, as most people would expect, corn on corn, five gallons, we're only talking about a few pounds of nitrogen. By the time we got to tassel time, it was a pretty sickly situation. In most cases, it was probably, you know, on me, shoulder high corn at best, and it was looking pretty, pretty sickly. Where we did nothing to that, that averaged 67 bushel, 67.7 bushel an acre. That's what that yielded. So then what we did is we went out there with our one row wide drop machine, Brian, which I saw somebody on Twitter that mocked, built one of those. Did you see that? I think it sent you a link. That was pretty cool to see that uh, kind of made the rounds. But uh, so we, we went out there at Tassel. So we went out there basically at R1 with 30 gallons of 28 and 5 gallons of ammonium thiol sulfate. So we tried to keep our sulfur to nitrogen ratio, you know, about a pound of sulfur for every six pounds of N. And surprisingly, even though that corn didn't get any taller, roots didn't grow anymore because we were in productive stage, we increased the yield to 153.6. I didn't do the math on the increase there, Brian, but it was more than probably what we thought we could rescue that late in the game. Yeah. You know, some things went right in that scenario. So mm -hmm. it was applied with the wide drop rigs right over the rows. Uh, there was moisture immediately after application to get it right down into the roots for, for quick uptake. But I think the moral of the story is, you know, nitrogen can move pretty quick within the corn plant. It can get to where it needs to go as long as there's some to be taken mm -hmm. up. So uh, I think that was a really cool study, and I think it – it really did highlight how much we can save and that it is worth coming back. I mean, it's easy to go out and look at it sometimes and throw the towel in, but mm -hmm. if you can make the application, especially if you have your own machinery and can spot spread some stuff, it is it is very worth it. So I did write down a couple of facts. Um, I tweeted out a thing yesterday or the day before from the University of Minnesota on some of this. Uh, they put a really nice piece together. Uh, generally, in those saturated conditions, you can lose about 5% per day of your nitrogen. Uh, flooded or saturated less than 48 hours, you generally don't use, lose a lot of your nitrogen. So when you get over 48, that's when we start to lose quite a bit. Um, my general rule of thumb, I guess, for a starting point, if you do need to make the rescue applications also, Josh, I like to be around 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. Then we can tweak it from there. You know, there's a lot of different nitrogen plans or whatever. But uh, start at 60 pounds. You know, in this scenario, we put a lot on, but we also knew that we put zero on up front. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some, I think 60 pounds is that is that starting point yep. overall. And don't forget the sulfur in those scenarios if needed. Yep. Yep. For sure. Uh, well, Erica, uh, as we kind of get to the end of the show here, always important to know where to find the show. 
Absolutely. So there's a couple different places you can find the show. Um, the first and foremost is on Twitter. So uh, my Twitter handle is at Erica Robertson. Josh, what's yours? At Josh Schaffner. And Brian? At Farmer Buckland. Wonderful. And you can also find it on Periscope, um, the live broadcast and replay. Um, you can subscribe via iTunes at podcast.pioneer.com. Um, and on YouTube, you can search keywords Buck, Schaffner, and Pioneer. That's a wrap for episode 12 of 2018. This show was recorded in Goodyear, Minnesota. It is produced by Josh Schaffner, Brian Buck, and Eric Robinson. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next time.